Hey, welcome to my video essay on the Hausa language. My name is Fionn and I will be your guide throughout the video. The roadmap for today will include topics such as the origins of the language and its people, some general information about modern day Hausa land, features of the language and the evolution of the language. The priority is on the latter topic as I want to focus on the history of how Hausa came to be and how it has evolved over time. The other topics are meant to ease you in by getting an understanding of the language and to have an appreciation for how it came into being. I hope that in the coming video, I do this topic justice and that you learn something new about this beautiful and diverse language. So without further ado, let us begin. Legend has it that there once was a prince from Baghdad called Bayajida, who was exiled after Queen Zidam conquered his village, a queen from his area. Bayajida left for Africa with some of his warriors, and at some point ended up in Borno. The most common rendition of the legend is that once in Borno, he asked the local blacksmiths to make him a knife. Once he had obtained said knife, he started traveling once again, to then end up in the town of Daura, located in modern-day Katsina. He came upon a house and asked the old woman who lived there for some water, and she told him a serpent by the name of Sarki, which means king in Hausa, guarded the well and only allowed the village inhabitants to take water from the well once a week. Bayajida set off to kill the snake. Once he got there, a battle ensued, where he beheaded the snake and took a well-deserved swig of water from the well. He collected the head and returned to the old lady's house to rest. Once the local queen, Queen Magajia Daurama, caught wind of what had happened, she offered sovereignty over half the town to whoever had slain the beast. Many men brought heads of snakes forth, but none matched the body. The old woman heard about what was happening and pointed the queen in the direction of Bayajida. Immediately, the queen went to find this noble warrior and grant him his prize. But upon finding him, he asked for a different prize, her hand in marriage. Out of gratitude, she married him. Now, I'll show you the rest of the story from here, but the story goes that Bayajida had three sons, one of which went on to have six more sons, and along with one of his other wives' sons formed the seven quote-unquote legitimate house estates. There is some stuff about seven illegitimate house estates, which was as a result of the queen gifting Bayajida a concubine, as due to cultural reasons, a queen could not have intercourse. The descendants of these children formed these seven illegitimate states. Now, this is just one story, and there are probably a few others, but this is the one I like the most. It has fighting, it has love, it has everything you'd want in a good story. But with that out of the way, let's have a look at Modern Hausa. Hausa is a language that can primarily be found in the northern parts of Nigeria, Ghana, Cameroon, Benin and Togo, and can also be found in the southern parts of Niger, Chad and Sudan. It is a member of the Afro-Asiatic language family and is spoken by over 52 million speakers as an L1 language and over 27 million as an L2. Hausa is classified as a Chadic language, which is a branch of the Afro-Asiatic language family specifically the West Chadic languages subgroup. The modern Hausa language has been influenced by a large number of other languages. This is due to being in such a diverse linguistic area and has influence from Arabic, English, French and most of the surrounding languages, of which there are a lot. The majority of native speakers can be found in the northernmost parts of Nigeria and southern Niger. It is used as the lingua franca of non-native speakers in a majority of the regions mentioned at the beginning of the section. There are many dialects of Hausa. These can be split into Eastern and Western classifications of dialects. In the Eastern classification, we have Dauransi, Kanansi, Bausansi, Goraransi, and Hadayansi. In the Western classification, we can find Sakwatansi, Katsinansi, Arewansi, Zanwaransi, and Kurwayansi which sounds like a funny Polish word. Each dialect has special cultural relevance compared to the others. For example, Katsina is seen as a transitional dialect between both classifications of dialects. Sokoto, or Sakwatansi, is used in a large majority of classical Hausa literature. Some dialects are considered to be northern, such as Awewa, meaning north. The major dialect spoken out of the southern dialect is Zazagansi, and the standard dialects are Dwara or Dwaransi and Kano, Ganansi. Going back to the origin story of the Hausa states, the Daura Emirate still exists to this day, with the current ceremonial monarch coming into power in 2007.
The king, al Haji Farouk Umar Farouk, is 93 years old. As a little bit of a segue into the more technical stuff, let's talk about the Hausa orthography. So, Hausa's official orthography is a Latin-based alphabet called Boko, which was introduced in the 1930s by the British colonial administration, who had control over the area at the time. Before this, Hausa was written in an Arabic alphabet called Ajami, which was used as far back as the 17th century. Unfortunately, there was never a standard system of Ajami introduced, so many different speakers use different symbols for different purposes. So now, let's take a closer look at the sounds of Hausa by moving into the phonology section. But if you close your eyes, does it almost feel like nothing changed? Firstly, I want to get the basics out of the way, like the consonant and vowel inventories and tone of Hausa. So, firstly, let's start off with the consonant inventory of Hausa. Okay, so we've kind of moved on to a live demo here just because I feel it would be easier to record. Uh, we got classic nasals like m and n. Uh, we got these implosives like a b, a d. If I did those right, I probably did them a bit off. Uh, then, as we have in English, uh, b and d. Moving on to this uh, kind of affricate, uh, we got z, j by itself, and it can become like a j with the do phoneme. Moving on to the dorsals in the voice plosive category, we have a kya with the front, and playing around we have a g and a gu. Moving on to the tenuous sounds still in the plosive category, we have t and ch, k, a k, and a k, and a glottal stop, which I can't pronounce. I'd, I'll do with the classic example. Ah, there we go. Uh, going on to our adjective, same kind of deal here, just with a bit more oomph added. So we got t, ch, k, k, and qu. <laughs> so now we move on. Sorry, now we move on to the uh, fricative. So we got a voice, just lone wolf by himself here. Z. Moving on to the tenuous sounds, we have a f, a s, a sh, and classic ha, a ha. Moving on to approximates now. I hope I get these right. These always mess me up. We got a la, a ya, a wa, and onto the rotics we have a ra and a ra. Wow, thank you, Pasfion, for that wonderful demo. So now we'll have a look at the House of Vowels, which I don't think warrant a live demo. So there are five vowels in Hausa, which can either be long or short, which results in ten monophthongs. Additionally, there are four diphthongs that are spoken in Hausa, totaling a total of 14 vowel phonemes. Uh, the diphthongs in Hausa are ai, au, u, and ui. And looking at the short vowels, we have i, e, a, o, and u. And then the long variants are just a longer version of that. Now moving on to tones, to get the basics, the fundamentals out of the way. So. Hausa is a tonal language, very interesting, very cool. And all of the five main vowels can either have a low, high, or falling tone. In standard written Hausa, the tone of a vowel is not marked. Uh, especially in usual practice, which dictates that high tones remain unmarked. But you can use a back take to represent this. So, tones can be represented using a grave accent, which is basically just a fada for low tones, uh, or a circumflex to represent the falling tones. So let's take a closer look at the glottal stop, which we saw earlier. Uh, Hausa actually has a requirement that syllables have a consonantal onset, which means words written with an initial vowel in the standard orthography we mentioned earlier actually begin with a glottal stop. So like words like Edo, which means I, actually have a glottal stop, so like Edo, like that, that closed throat at the start, and Ado, same thing, starts with a vowel in the orthography, but we can see it actually has a glottal stop, so you have Ado. Looking at the voiceless labial fricative af, uh, we can find that it surfaces commonly as af, which we saw in the consonant inventory. Uh, but wh when word final in onomatopoeic words, it can be seen as af or ap, and it can also be found as aha. So Hasa doesn't actually have a phoneme ap contrasting with af. So English loan words that contain the phoneme ap usually appear with the af phoneme. For example, here's a loan word uh, in English meaning paint, 
and we can see in Hausa it is fainty, fainty, and plaster. Uh, it, it, I love how similar these sound. We have a uh, filasta, filasta. Looking closer at the uh -huh, though, uh, when it's found before a background well, uh, it where it sounds usually changed to double forgetive uh -huh. So you know you have the a pa which we mentioned earlier. Uh, so here's a loan word from English. We have powder, which is a uh, hoda, hoda. You see the p changes to a h uh, there. Moving on from those groups of sound changes, we can look at the nasals, uh, where we can see that when they're word final, they can often appear as velar ng. This is to neutralize the contrast that can be found when these phonemes appear word finally. Uh, with an exception of when they are in idea phones, so like onomatopoeia. Uh, here are two examples. We have kadang and uh, nang, which mean a little and here, respectively. Now this kind of brings us on to what I find most interesting on a phonemic basis for where sounds come from in Hausa, uh, obviously not including morphology, which we'll get into, is the the alveolar tap roll. <coughs> I find this most interesting because uh, the classic British, they messed up. Uh, they did not think of every case for the orthography of Hausa, and so there was no way to differentiate this alveolar tap with the retroflex native flap, which can be seen as just a regular R in the language. Uh, so they use a tilde to differentiate the two together. The reason I find this so interesting though is because loanwords are actually a huge major historical source of the phonemic R in all positions, no matter where it is in the word. Uh, in particular, the word finally and before coronals such as N, D, D, only R occurs. Here are some examples found in Philip J. Jagger's book, simply titled Hausa. So from Yoruba, we have Adire, which means tie dyed cloth. Uh, and all these words here now are from Arabic. We have Azahar, which means mid-afternoon. Uh, Riba, which means prophet. Sura, which means chapter in the Quran. Uh, moving on to Kanuri. This is a loan word from Kanuri. We, it's, a, it's a doozy. Uh, Karua, which means prostitute. I would love to know the cultural significance of why this word came from Kanuri. Uh, I'll try research that. I'll get back to you on that. Uh, we, from English now, we have Batir, which means battery. Uh, Kiris, which means grease, and Reza, which means razor. Uh, and I love hearing the English ones because you can kind of tell they're from English. Uh, looking at Fulani loanword now, we just have one here for the example. We have Sharo, which means test of manhood. Very, very interesting word. From the Tuareg language, we have Tatabara, which means pigeon. And here we're just this, these few examples for this one phoneme, we can see how much influence other languages have had on Hausa. Now I don't want to go too into depth on these loan words and the likes where these phonemes come from. I want to save this for the evolution of Hausa. Uh, but with that done, we can move on to other features of the language. Yeah. Oh shit, Mikey Jackson! Okay, so to finish off the language features section, let us discuss the syntax of the language. A section which I want to keep a little shorter, but it's important to know, it's important to go over this to get a nice understanding and appreciation for the language. So Hausa is a very strict subject-verb-object language, where the subject-predicate element of the sentence contains a subject, person-aspect-complex, which is shortened down to PAC, a verb phrase, uh, where the person aspect complex consists of a subject agreement pronoun and a tense aspect mood marker. So here's an example from the book which we can go over. Again this example is from the book Hausa by Philip J. Jagger who I've got to shout out his research has helped me so much. He has gr a great book and this great paper on the topic which I'll talk about in the next section. But here we can see we have Malamina Yana Koyamini Hausa and we have the Malamina which is the subject so S out of the VO. Uh, yana, which is the uh, person aspect complex, and the verb phrase, which contains both the verb and the object. So, koya, teach, and uh, to me, to first person singular, mini. So that's SVO. Uh, same deal with the Rana Tafari down here. Sun, fall, so third person female. Uh, sun has set is what it translates to. So that was a very basic example, but should have given you a good idea of how Hausa works, you know, in the most base cases. 
But there are several verb grades in Hausa, which we won't go over everything. I'm just going to go over transitive verbs because, you know, they're most common usually. So there are transitive, both mono and di transitive. Efferential verbs, intransitive verbs, copular verbs, dative verbs, and associative verbs. For our purposes, we'll just look at the transitive verbs, as I said. Uh, so they're either monotransitive or ditransitive, as we mentioned earlier. Monotransitive verbs follow a pattern of subject, verb, direct object, while ditransitives follow the pattern of subject, verb, indirect object, direct object. A lot of monotransitive verbs in Hausa also function as two object ditransitive verbs, so in the form of subject, verb, direct object, and complementizer. So now let's have a closer look at monotransitive verbs with some examples. So we have Kina Jin Hausa. Do you speak or understand Hausa? Ya Ja Ragon. So he pulled along the ram. And just one more little example Mezaka Chi. What will you eat? And of course, all of these follow the subject verb direct object pattern. Uh, but the direct object is able to be left out when context dictates that it is recoverable through inference or pragmatics. So, for example, ka yara, did you fix it? Or yasaya, omitting the direct object. The direct object in this case being just it. Did you fix it? He bought it. It's able to be inferred. Finally, we'll just have a look at ditransitive verbs, which occur in the pattern of subject, verb, indirect object, and direct object. So here are some examples. We'll go through three here. We got zai miki wuya. So zai subject verb miki indirect object, wuya direct object, uh, which it all translates to it will be difficult for you. Next we have son gaya mana labari, which means they told us and use the exact same subject verb indirect object direct object, and finally tatuna wa mijinta alkawari, which means she reminded her husband of the promise. So now let's get into the real meat and potatoes of the video, the historical side of Hausa, how it evolved, where it came from, why is it a Chadic language? Okay, let's go. The year is 1844, and researcher T. N. Newman first suggests that there could be a relationship between Hausa and Semitic languages, which could make Hausa a part of the Afro-Asiatic language family. For a hundred years, there were discussions taking place as whether to actually classify Hausa as an Afro-Asiatic language. Unfortunately, there was some controversy surrounding this idea. Being the late 1800s, early 1900s, many scholars were perhaps a little bit prejudicial, to say the least. So the idea that Chadic languages, like Hausa, could be in the same family as quote-unquote Caucasian languages, like Egyptian and Semitic languages, were out of the question for a lot of people. Thankfully, today, Hausa is rightfully considered a Chadic Afro-Asiatic language, just as God intended. Unfortunately, there is very little reliable historical slash linguistic documentation for Sub-Saharan languages. These constraints also apply to Hausa. Despite being the best researched Sub-Saharan language, with three substantial reference grammars, with grammatical and lexical resources that have existed for over 150 years, because of these restrictions, much of what we can actually reconstruct from Hausa is actually deductible from comparative studies of Hausa and how it is related to other Chadic languages, then projecting backwards to see how the language could have been in the past. Interestingly enough, the difference between the retroflex flap r and fla uh, fl tap trill r, which we talked about earlier, was highlighted by Al Haji Musa, the Hausa speaking assistant of a Hausa researcher called Priyatse in 1907. That was just a cool fact I thought you should know. In regards to the etymology of the term Hausa, several ideas have been floating around and keep resurfacing now and again over the last number of years, some more plausible than the others. Skinner, in 1968, suggested that it derives from Songhai Hausa, meaning East. However, Heath, 2005, gives the meaning as North Bank of the Niger River, and transcribes it as Hausa which is spelt the exact same way, pronounced the exact same way, tone and everything as the actual name of the language in Hausa. These are two relatively plausible origin stories, with Heat's story being regarded as the most likely source of the name. Interestingly enough, due to very scarce archaeological evidence in the area, linguistics has perhaps played a greater than normal role in our understanding of the area's history. Greenberg's 1963 comprehensive reclassification of African languages is still the universally accepted model today in which Greenberg classified five groups for the Afro-Asiatic language family. Ancient Egyptian, Berber, Chadic, Cushitic, and Semitic, with the six later being added, 
which was omotic. A very strong genetic link between Afro-Asiatic languages is grammatical gender. As you're about to see, we can really see the connection between modern Afro-Asiatic languages and Proto-Afro-Asiatic. So, for this example, we're going to look at some Afro-Asiatic feminine gender markers for possessive nouns and see if we can spot similarities. Holy guacamole, aren't these incredibly similar to one another? I don't even need to explain what is happening here. You can very clearly see how similar these are. Uh, as it turns out, House and Chaddock have inherited an Afro-Asiatic gender slash number marking pattern which distinguishes masculine uh, with a n, feminine with a t as you can see here, and plural once again with a n. Looking at more similarities with the plural marker n in the second person plural pronouns of the following languages. So second person singular male, and I'll probably butcher this, we, in Hausa we got ka, ancient Egyptian, chu, Akkadian, uh, ka, tuare, kai, beja, ka. Um, without saying the names of the languages this time. Kin, tum, ki, kam, ki, kun, tun, kunu, wun, kna. Note the common cup present in all examples shown here, and the second feminine singular forms all ending in a nasal. Looking at lexical evidence for a common ancestor between Hausa and other Afro-Asiatic languages, look at these word formats which still exist today despite thousands of years. So we got uh, the, a dash here, which by the way means that there's an unknown vowel to be subbed into this position. So we got m, m, t, s, m, t, f, d, am, uh, all, all with their respective meanings beside them. Uh, the paper, by the way, which I'm getting these examples from, Again, got a shout out, Philip J. Jagger, really helped me out. And you'll find all references at the end of the video, by the way. Uh, anyway, let's get into the first example. So we're going to get into to die and see how Hausa is related to other Afro-Asiatic languages. So looking at the mt, we got Hausa as mutu, ancient Egyptian, mt, mehri, which is mot, ugaritic, which is mt again, <laughs> Hebrew, mat, Aramaic, mit, if that's how you pronounce it, Arabic, Mat and Amharic and Tigrinya both have the same thing. Mota, Turarig, Ye Mut, Bole Motu and Rendie, if that's how you pronounce it, uh, Mut. So very similar. Going into the origin of the actual language rather than the identity of the Hausa people, we actually don't know where and when Afro-Asiatic and Chadic languages should be placed exactly. We do actually have evidence going back 4,000 years ago for Semitic languages, 6,000 for ancient Egyptian. Closeness is generally viewed by linguists to be a reliable metric for rapid recent expansion. So looking at Semitic, for example, the difference between modern Semitic and old Semitic is nowhere near as large as the difference between modern Semitic and another Chadic slash Amotic language. Amotic being the most internally diverse subgroup of the Afro-Asiatic language family shows us that it was probably the earliest to split from early Afro-Asiatic. By looking at these facts, and the massive internal diversity of the Afro-Asiatic language family, we can reasonably conclude that the proto-language existed in the region of 10,000 to 15,000 years ago, most likely originating from the southeastern Sahara or Horn of Africa. Assuming that what Greenberg said is true, with there being five, later six, fully independent coordinate families for Afro-Asiatic, then they must have originated and diversified on continental Africa itself. Moving on from that, the claim by Parsons, 1960, that how says me slash me, meaning what, was a loanword from the Arabic ma, is a great example to show why distinguishing contact-induced loanwords, lookalikes, and true cognates is important. The aforementioned claim was found to be incorrect as Parson did not know that other similar Chadic languages, unlike Hausa, that had no contact with Arabic, yet they had the same form of what being ma, as we saw earlier indicating that both me and ma actually come from the same source, i.e. they don't originate from Arabic, but both originate from a common ancestor. The data below also illustrates the importance of being accurate with the status of where words come from. So, hausa, haka means dig, and in English you could kind of construe that hak is a synonym for dig, but this is chance resemblance. Looking again at English and hausa, we have manguaro, meaning mango in English. Both similar, but both borrowed from the Tamil language via Portuguese. Now, looking at the house in Arabic example, you know, me and ma, they are cognates, so they come from the same source. 
Hausa's language family subgroup of Chadic is generally accepted to have come into existence after the Proto-Afro-Asiatic split about 5,000 to 6,000 years ago, spreading across the Sahara into the Lake Chad Basin. Interestingly enough, the linguistic geography of the Chadic family looks to be invasive. Chadic languages are contiguous with Plateau and Adamawa languages, so it appears that communities of Chadic speakers probably expanded south and displaced resident Niger-Congo languages. The vast geographical extent of Hausa indicates that the language had relatively recent and rapid expansion out of its historic homeland, and there are relatively few dialectical differences, which by the way is unique for a Chadic language in their particular region. The dialects with the greatest diversity are in the northwest of the Hausa speaking area, like Sokoto, Zamfara, Katsina, which aligns with what we were talking about earlier, with this being the origin of the Hausa identity. In regards to the expansion of the Hausa language, there are two basic theories, that it moved from east to west or from west to east. It is possible, however, that both are valid theories. So what could have happened is, uh, a long time ago, Old Hausa first expands at an early date from its core area of dispersal, so it moves from east to west. And then in more recent times, it's possible that Hausa started to spread more rapidly, uh, f but this time from northwest to southeast. This seems to be highly likely uh, and explains pretty well the present day distribution of the Hausa language. Finally, I want to talk about prostitution, as I promised. Specifically, so when we talked about the word for prostitute coming from Kanuri which sounds, it sounds very interesting, like why did it come from Kanuri? Uh, Jagger's paper talks about how Kanuri speakers have represented a dominant political and cultural group in northeastern Nigeria, with loan words like Siruma meaning title, Dandali meaning open space, Ingarma meaning stallion, Kwaskwarima meaning improvement or refurbishment, Rubuta meaning right, Unguzuma meaning midwife, probably said that wrong, Yarima meaning prince. Now the paper doesn't actually specifically talk about the prostitute loan word, which I was really hoping it would considering it's the same guy that made the book that you know included it. Uh, but it could be reasonable to say that it just came about because of the influence that Kanuri speakers had on the area at the time. But we can also see political titles such as prince and the word title itself are loan words from Kanuri. Uh, so maybe, I don't know, Kanuri teaches us that the title of prostitute is just as valid as the prince, I don't know. I'll leave it up to you to decide. But that concludes our journey of looking at the Hausa language from a historical point of view. As I mentioned before, I tried to keep the historical side of things to the latter half of the video, but it did creep through to the phonetic section with the Ure phoneme. Uh, it was too interesting like, not to mention. I hope that I have properly demonstrated how Hausa's culture and language have come to be, and that you learned something new not only about Hausa, but the Afro-Asiatic language family as a whole, and how important historical linguistics can be not only in linguistics, but for history as a whole. So thank you for watching, and shout out to Philip J. Jagger, you're a real one on God.